Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us from wherever you are around the world. We've got a little bit of a unique program today, which is really no program at all. Um, so whereas a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of prior sessions that I've done and that you experience on GMAT Club um, have a specific topic or a specific focus. I've done interview prep. I've done career goals essays. I've done round one versus round two. A couple of weeks ago, I did round two strategy. Um, and then we, in those, we save time at the end for questions. In this case, what we're doing is uh, dedicating the entire period of time to questions. Now, I guess the question is how many people will end up joining for just an open Q and A like that? I happen to think it would be, uh, it would be, you know, interesting. You could put your questions out there. We could talk about them. Um, but you know, I understand if there are fewer, if fewer people are interested in doing that. So let's see what comes up in the comments. I guess the point today is, uh, is an open Q and A, an open question and answer session. You can feel free to post your questions. They could be about MBA applications, career stuff, even, um, rounds, schools, really whatever in the comments. I'll read them and uh, and then I'll be able to to answer them and I'll try to answer them in a way that uh, that is beneficial for everybody. So we kind of answer it specific to the person who's posting, but also then extrapolate it for the benefit of others. Uh, my name is Greg Guglielmo. I'm the founder of Avanti Prep. You can visit us at avantiprep.com. You could see the 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 link right there on the screen. We are running, and I think it's going to. It got posted in the comments might also get posted across the bottom of the screen um, uh, that we're running. It was, it was actually our Black Friday deal uh, to save an extra 10%. It was originally through tomorrow, December 3rd, uh, save an extra 10% on hourly services, um, now extended another week through December 10th. So if that's something you're interested in, you can visit our website and check out directly using that coupon code that was just up on the screen. Um, and is also found in the chat box and you can, um, uh, or, you know, if you want to sign up for a free consultation first, that's fine too. You can also do that up on our website. Uh, feel free to peruse the website. We work with applicants all over the world on every part of the application process, um, both through packages where we might work with applicants in, um, in a comprehensive, more comprehensive capacity, walk through every phase of the process together, or, um, through hourly services and hourly services can kind of be mixed and matched and deployed wherever you think you need the most help. Maybe it's a couple of resume reviews. Maybe it's some essay reviews. Maybe before you even get into the essay reviews, it's essay brainstorming and story development. What's unique to you? How might you approach a certain essay? What topics should you focus on? How might you go about structuring that essay? And then once you draft it, we uh, would review it, provide comments, provide feedback, provide very specific thoughts on that. And that's just really the tip of the iceberg resume and essays. Um, I mean, recommender selection, recommendation strategy, recommendation feedback, um, short answer review, application review, school selection, uh, interview prep later on. If you're invited to interview, we do have a stand um, a standalone service. So that's uh, just, you know, some of the, the, the quick and dirty on what we do, what we work with applicants. Obviously, we'd love to get in touch with you and see if and where we can help. Um, so let's let's get into the question. This is an open Q&A, so let's get into the questions. I'm gonna start by going in order. We'll see how many come in. Uh, and I'll fill, you know, fill some time if there's not a ton of questions, hopefully there are. I'll fill some time with some other thoughts, things I think are often overlooked and, and so forth. Um, so the first question I see on here uh, is from Vivek. Why do business schools ask if I'm a first generation student? If I am one, does it have a negative impact on my profile? That's a great question, Vivek. Uh, so that's a question that that in applications is probably a fairly new question that schools are asking. Uh, why do they ask? They're basically curious about the context um, of one's background or upbringing, if you will. Uh, I think they want schools want to make sure that they are evaluating candidates 
in context of where they come from, um, opportunities they might have had. They want to have a complete understanding of of who you are, what the educational background. It's not to say that somebody whose parents were, um, you know, PhDs is going to get evaluated one way, and you know, somebody who is a first generation college student to uh, is going to get evaluated in completely another way. But but um, but but it's there. I mean, it, schools will pay attention to that. They want to understand. I think some of the wording they'll often use is they want to understand your accomplishments in context of um, where you come from. It definitely will not have a negative impact on your profile. If anything, I would say it might have a positive impact because schools will understand that uh, you know you were kind of taking this next big step within your family and you were a first you know did did become worked hard enough and uh, and all of that and had what it became a, a, a first generation college student. So um, no, definitely not that so that's why they would be curious about it and definitely not a negative impact. I would think if anything, um, a positive one. And you could think about, you know, you might even think about, how that flows or how that experience, you, you almost get into a little bit of family history here and family tra trajectory and things like that. But um, you might even think a little bit about how that, uh, how that influenced your own experiences and worldview and values. Uh, it kind of depends school to school and essay to essay. But I would think that if you think about your own personal, your life, your story, seminal moments in it, influences you've had, steps you've took, barriers you've broken, whatever the case may be, uh, it might, Vivek, be, there might be hints of that even beyond the yes, no question that they ask in the application. There could potentially be, um, there could potentially be elements of that that feed into other, other essays. Uh, there are schools out there, I think in my own alma mater, Haas, for example, a few years ago, um, added an even more extensive version of that question in their application. They want to know not just are you a first generation college student, but there's a section of the application where they'll ask, you know, were you raised by your grandparents? Were you um, raised in a multi generational household? Did you have response? Did you have to like work full time growing up or um, have financial or even quasi parental responsibility for younger siblings? Again, all of that is just trying to understand what people's situations were. They don't want to like, you know, if somebody was working full time since they were 14 years old and uh, in order to help support their family because of a certain parental situation, whatever, they want to know that they want to understand that that's part of your story. And it's also important context, critical context, really, to understanding um, the achievements you've made. So that's kind of why, and then Tassel will even ask a little essay, a small essay to explain further about that. Um, so that's why they ask, and definitely not a negative impact. Uh, I would say, if anything, a positive impact. Hang on for one second. All right. We'll scroll down to some additional questions. I have a question. How significant is the nature of work I have experience in? Um, I'm going to try to interpret that. I don't know if it's an, a super clear question. I guess it's saying like, is the type of work I have important? So a work experience question, in this case, more type of work, not necessarily quantity, uh, of work or years of experience. So type of work. Um, look, I, I think you could usually go to a class profile page of any MBA program. And by the way, that's something I would encourage you to do essentially no matter what, without regard for work experience, just as you think about schools. Um, hopefully, by the way, we're on December 2nd here. These deadlines are like a month away. Um, round two deadlines are, are mostly a month, five weeks, four or five weeks away. Hopefully, you've already picked your schools and are that you want to apply to and are pretty deep into the process. If you're just thinking about school selection now, you're going to have a pretty busy few weeks. Um, 
and you know, again, we should probably talk about what, no matter what phase you're in, we should probably talk about that. You could sign up for a free consultation at avantiprep.com. Um, how significant is the nature of my work experience? So if you do go to those class profile pages, what you'll see there are a whole host of statistics, oftentimes average GPAs, average ages, average years of work experience, average GMAT scores, um, other kind of statistics related to the class. You'll also, not always, but often find the industry or educational backgrounds from which the students in a given MBA program come. Um, you will usually see that there is a wide variety um, and that really, if you talk to any admissions committee, they say it does, we are open to evaluating and including people from all sorts of backgrounds. Um, you know, we've seen people who've worked in arts and entertainment or even theater apply to MBA programs that, that we've worked with. So there's really not like a single industry you need to come from anything like that. It's, it's about, it's about how you tell your story, why you need an MBA, can you show why you want an MBA, what your goals are, why you need an MBA, and can you show the school if you do come from an industry that's let's say not as business relevant, like for example, you know, the theater people who worked in theater, let's say beforehand, that's more of an extreme example. They will now schools are open to those applicants, but those applicants will still need to make sure that they show in the applications that they're ready to thrive, succeed, and contribute in an MBA program, and that they understand why they're pursuing an MBA, what they hope to get out of it, what can they can bring to their classmates, what their goals are. The goals post-MBA should feel clear, specific, and credible. Um, so, you know, again, this, this, this theater example is a little bit of an extreme one. Uh, I guess the overarching points here are that schools are definitely open to people from a variety of backgrounds and industry. Um, you will st still see some skew, of course, toward the traditional pre-MBA industries and feeder industries, consulting, banking, finance, you know, things like, uh, things of that nature. And if you do come from a more non-traditional, basically the further removed your pre-MBA experience is from business experience, the, the, the greater the onus is going to be on you as an applicant to make sure that you're showing that you have business skills, analytical skills, you've got some exposure to business related stuff. If, even if you, you know, obviously tons of people from engineering apply to MBA programs, uh, super common. You'll see a huge representation of engineers at a lot of MBA programs. Now, if you were somebody though, who worked in who studied engineering more technically and purely didn't take any business classes um, and then worked in a purely technical engineering role, you're really going to want, this is something to extrapolate no matter what your industry is, but you're really going to want to make sure that on your resume and in your recommendations and to an extent in your essays, if the essay question is relevant, you're really going to want to make sure that you're showing skills beyond just technical, the technical skills beyond just the engineering. How can you do that? Well, think about who do you partner with in your engineering role? Do you, do you ever have to present? Think about other skills you can demonstrate. It, like, do you ever have to present to senior people? Do you ever, what teams do you have to partner or collaborate with? What are the business results or business impacts that your work is driving? Do you, and do you do anything that's client facing at all, even internal clients? Um, do you manage it? You know, have you been there a couple of years and now you have five engineers under you, junior engineers under you. Well, that's, that's management and leadership experience. Did you manage the intern program? You could think of all that whole host. Did you ever have to analyze anything that was more business related? Did you have to customize what you were building um, for certain different customer segments, different audiences, different geographies? Have you done anything cross-cultural or international? Just think of that host of sort of MBA relevant skills. Um, and I think that will be, that does become super important. Uh, so yeah, it, the, the nature of your experience, by the way, too, if you have, if you don't have like any kind of business, this will be a little late to do for people who are applying round two of this year. But if you were looking further ahead, you're going to apply round one of next year. And you say to yourself, you know what? I, I don't have much quote unquote business experience. Think about 
taking some business coursework. Um, I mean, HBX certificate of, re uh, of readiness, the HBX core E option as it's known, um, is, is, I don't know, probably the most cited one now. It's a little more comprehensive. It's a little more expensive relative to some others that are out there, but, uh, that's an option that, you know, you'll get business analytics, you'll get accounting, you'll get different modules in that. Uh, and there are other gradients within that UC Berkeley online has a math for management course. You could find discrete courses. If you haven't taken any math, by the way. Um, so, okay. Engineers typically take tons of, tons of math or math related courses, but if somebody were a, I don't know, liberal arts major and then worked in nonprofit in like a non-business role in nonprofit or something. Okay. Now that applicant doesn't have much to show in the way of analytical coursework or analytical on the job experience. Um, those individuals should certainly look at taking some of these business courses. If you've never taken calculus or statistics, those would be usually be the first two cited off um, out of admissions committees is if you've never taken any calculus or statistics, Take those. Take take the actual single courses. Get an A in them. Take them for a grade. Get an A in them. Again, this is going to be hard to do for somebody who's applying right now. If somebody applying right now who has to do this, by the way, um, you should probably sign up for the courses and show that you're going to be taking them, and then uh, and then take them after you apply and update the admission. Get good grades in them and update the admissions committee shortly after you as soon as possible after you submit your applications, even if that's updating them, you know, where I've taken the midterm, like you apply January 10th, let's say, um, maybe you have the midterm by like the end of January, send them an email and let them know, you know, including your application optional essay. I understand that, you know, I don't have as much business analytical background. Um, hopefully your GMAT score or GRE score is strong to help buttress that, but you'll also probably want to look at, can I take a calc class? Can I take a statistics class? to show that I can succeed and then tell them you're doing that. Even put the PDF of the sign up form in the app. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, acknowledge it, tell them you're doing it and then update them that let you know that it's actually underway. Uh, and you're making progress and you're doing well in it. If you've taken calculated statistics, but have never taken any business courses, um, that you could look at things like accounting and finance and so forth. Um, so I know that was, covered a few different things from, from theater folks to, uh, engineers to liberal arts majors. But, um, basically everyone, you got to kind of think about every applicant, every applicant based on who they are and every applicant based on where they've worked and what they've studied is going to have inherent strengths and weaknesses to their profile. The important thing is to figure out what those are so that you can highlight the strengths, unpack the value of the strengths, the unique value of those strengths, and address or proactively address or preempt the weaknesses a little bit. And how do you do that? Well, you think about what can I highlight in my resume? What are these other kind of alternate transcripts I can build or courses I could take or skills I could build. Um, if I don't have any kind of like very much leadership experience and I'm applying again, this would be hard to do too hard to do in a month, but I'm light on leadership experience. Well, maybe think about applying next year and it over the next 13 months or 10 months, if you apply in round one, um, what can you raise your hand to lead at work? What can you get involved in outside of work deep, deeper in few, leadership things is better than a little bit, you know, superficial and sporadic. Think about it. They're like two things, maybe one thing inside of work, one thing outside of work. I could really sink my teeth into and take a leadership role in and create unique impact in. Um, so every applicant think about whether it's industry, coursework, major, uh, lack of certain type of experiences. Think about your strengths and your weaknesses, highlight the strengths, unpack the value of them, but also then, uh, you know, take steps to address the weaknesses however you can. Low GPA, average GMAT with a good statement of purpose. Can I get admitted to a good school? Uh, yeah, tough, uh, tough question. Um, I think that the best way to answer that would be again, like, look at 
look at the av- look at the typical scores and ranges for schools that you apply to. The answer here, this is a question from Baton. Um, there are gradients to this answer. It sort of depends how good the school, like if, if a school, if you have a low GPA and an average GMAT for a school where you are an overrepresented applicant, then even the best, to be blunt about it, I guess, even the best statement of purpose or essay um, if the school is too good and you're not, you know, like you're, it's, it's probably not going to do it. I think, what, but what, I think here we get into like the gradients of what, what does it mean a good school? Um, there are a lot of good schools. I think you just have to calibrate, look at the data, look at the average GMAT scores and average GPAs for the schools you're interested in. Look at the GMAT ranges really more than the GPA ranges for that matter almost even more than the, the averages. Uh, a lot of schools will publish a middle 80% range. If you can't find it for that school you're interested in, find a similarly ranked school or find a school with a similar average GMAT. And you could usually kind of extrapolate or deduce what the, what the one you're looking at range would be. Also keep in mind, like if you're, you know, an Indian applicant applying to US schools, uh, you'll usually see something like a 30 or 40 well, they don't publish the statistic, but oftentimes there's like a 30 point, the, the average scores for the Indian applicants or the Indian students in those schools is like 30 or 40 points higher than the the class profile average that you'll see. Um, we even, we do have a little bit of data to support that. Um, you know, there are schools in, there's a school in the U.S. kind of top 10 to 15, 10 to 12 range of the rankings uh, whose average GMAT score is usually 715 to 720. It's average, the average, oh, so the whole class, 715 or 720. The average GMAT score for the Indian students at that school, 755. Now, and that's, and that's 715 or 720 includes those in the Indian students. So if you actually took the, the Indian subset out of um, the overall average, it might go down, I don't know what it would go down to, say a 710. The Indian, the average GMAT score for the Indian students in that, and that's a 10 to 15 ranked school. That's not an M7 school or a top five school. 715, 720 for the whole class, 755 for the Indian students in the class. Um, Ranges, that school probably has like a 690 to 760, middle 80% range for the whole class, maybe 680 to 760, 670 to 760. The Indian students in that class in that school have a 730 to 780 as their middle 80% range. Again, that's a top 10 to 15 school in the US, not an M7. Um, M7, you could probably deduce would be a little even a tick higher than that. So taking it back to the question, if you have a low GPA and an average GMAT for that school, like a 720, well, your average for the whole for the against the whole class profile, but you're 30 or 40 points below average in context of, you know, your applicate applicant pool, I hate to use that term, but um, we sort of have to. The So for that school, yeah, you could have the best essay in the world and it's not, it's not, um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. Like the, the, I think a way to think about the GMAT, especially if you're from an overrepresent GMAT, GRE, to an extent GPAs, even if, especially if you're from an overrepresented or hyper-competitive applicant pool, it, it is. The, the standardized test score is one part of this holistic evaluation that spans everything. Your whole story, your goals, your essays, your recommendations, your career progression, your, um, your scores, your undergrad, where you went, what you studied, and so forth. Um, but it is also, at, so it's true. When schools say that, that's true. The GBAT, we, we conduct holistic. They'll hear the, you know, probably hear it ad nauseum. The evaluation process is holistic. That's true. The GMAT is just one part of that puzzle, but it is also in some cases, um, particularly if you're applying from a hyper-competitive applicant pool, it is also sort of an initial barrier to entry. You want to look at those ranges and you really want to look at them in context of your applicant. Like if you, you can't just look at them in like the, the whole class profile, you got to look at it specific to who you're up against. Um, so in that case, yeah, the, the Low GPA, average GMAT with a good essay. In that example, I I think you need to calibrate 
I think you would need to recalibrate where you're applying. Maybe you try for like one reach or two reaches to schools like that, but you really want to start to find situations where your GPA and your GMAT better align with the ranges of that school. And sometimes better aligning means, uh, means in this case where you know citing Indian applicants, you know typically have average GMATs thirty to forty points higher than the posted averages. Um, alignment should factor that in. Align, alignment in that case doesn't mean the school has a seven ten average and I have a 710 GMAT. Alignment in that case would mean the school is a 710 average and I have a 740 GMAT uh, or a 750 GMAT. So I hate to sound, make that sound so dire, um, but uh, but I think you really want, I, I'm sometimes surprised if I'm being candid, when we receive free consultation inquiries that people haven't done even a little bit of homework on that. There are some excellent blog posts out there I've shared one last time. I'll share it again. I think our moderator today authored this report four years ago um, on GMAT Club. It's an MBA admissions chances top 50 analysis post. Um, we don't have to pull it up, but I'll just, it basically shows acceptance rates for Indian applicants by GMAT score to the top 20 schools in the U.S. Uh, not Well, there's a little bit of school-by-school school data, but um, huge sample size, by the way. I think it's like 5,000, over 5,000 um, people in the sample. So if we could get that link up, I think that's something. So do, do your homework on that stuff. That That is essential to building your school. Understanding that data is essential to uh, putting together a, a kind of an intelligent school selection or school strategy. Can I apply to an MBA without work experience in the U.S.? Absolutely, you can. Um, people have work, you know, so I'm assuming here maybe somebody is interested in applying to U.S. programs but hasn't worked in the U.S. Absolutely, that is super common. Um and, you know, schools expect that. I think one thing to look for, though, is if, are there any, um, and this this goes back to this, you know, this, this, this comment I made a few minutes ago about thinking about what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses? Every applicant should do that. Every applicant can do that. Um, and so absolutely work experience anywhere is work experience. But still, it's worth considering, have I done any international work at all? Even if you've not traveled internationally. Are you ever working or on calls with or collaborating with colleagues who are located in different offices? There could be some interesting tidbits there. I think schools do like to see, um, you know, in, in international work experience if you've had it or anything cross-cultural. Uh, don't don't fret. Don't worry if you don't have that. Play to your strengths. Unpack the value of what you've done. But you can definitely apply to an MBA. U.S. MBA program without work experience in the U.S. Most U.S. programs, um, you'll see different statistics, kind of depends how different schools count it. Probably like a third of, let's say one third of the student body at a typical U.S. top 20 or 25 program is international. Some of them, of course, there's some have worked in the U.S., some have worked in international, meaning non-U.S., uh, Maybe you get up to closer to 40% if you count dual, you know, U U.S. passport holders who also have a second, um, you know, second citizenship or something like that. But yeah, you can absolutely apply to an MBA without work experience in the U.S., but for anyone, even by the way, for in individuals who work in the U.S. but and are applying to U.S. programs, international experience is generally for almost every applicant considered an asset. And it doesn't, it, you know, and again, it don't worry if you don't have like purely international experience where you actually went and worked abroad or something like that. Think about who have I collaborated with? Who have I presented to? Who have I served? Am I working? If you're working for some multinational corporation, odds are you've done, so like don't omit, odds are you've done things that have crossed borders uh, or, you know, involved colleagues from different places. So don't, um, don't sell yourself short on that. Make sure that stuff is in in your app, you know, in, on bullets on your resume and that sort of thing. 
um, how, how the degree to which it's covered will naturally correspond to how much of that you've done. Um, but, but that's, that's how I would think about, uh, that. And by the way, too, sometimes cross-cultural work doesn't need to be internet, purely international. Uh, there are very different cultures within certain, you know, a single country and that sort of thing. So think about, think about all those for, um, at a you specific kind of level. Uh, I am planning to quit my job and start my own business. Will that be a disadvantage? Very interesting question. Um, I think well, I'd be curious to know what the job is and how long you've been there. Uh, part of me, you know, I often say don't, you know, you don't want to put your life on hold just because because you're applying an MBA program. But I think that's, it's so person specific because for some people, the, the MBA feels like the must thing that I absolutely have to do next. Uh, and if, so I think this question, um, I would ask the person who posed it to think about, to think about like, what's, how does starting that business stack up for you relative to the desire to, to pursue an MBA? Um, and, and when you want to do that, if this is like a burning passion kind of business that you feel like every, all the arrows in your life have been pointing you toward, and this is finally your chance to do it. And now is the time that I think you got to follow that. Um, if instead it's like a, ah, you know, kind of want to play around with this side thing, um, maybe bide my time for a few months before starting an MBA program, play around with, build a website, sell a few widgets. Uh, then I, I would, I would probably think about it's hard to do just speaking to you like this. I'd want to, I'd want to ask questions too, but, um, then I'd think about, can you do it on the side for a few more months, stay at your current job at least until round two applications come to fruition. That's only three months away. Like those deadlines are a month away. And then you usually hear your round two results by like mid-March. So uh, and what I'm getting at there is that it can be a little bit disruptive. It can be a little bit of a disadvantage or at least something that needs a good amount of explaining. If somebody quit their job in dis like four weeks before the I don't know how imminently you'd be planning to quit it, uh, to leave your job. Doing so like four weeks before deadlines, I think is like, it's going to put, it's going to raise eyebrows. Um, you, you, if you did do that, and even if, if this was, if the business was this huge passion, I got to do it now. I got to seize the moment. Uh, I would definitely address that a few sentences, maybe a paragraph or two in an optional essay. Uh, schools are at, for anyone out there, think about what schools are going to have questions about low GPAs, employment gaps, um, choice of recommenders, things like this, a little more, um, you know, not quite as common in this case, a little more unique, but, but, but if you did do that, you'd want to explain it. But I, I think it's really thinking if, it, if it's this passion, I have to do it. I want to start my business. Now's the time I've always, this is my dream. I think you got to listen to that. And I mean, maybe even by the way, maybe that dream feeds into why you're pursuing an MBA. Maybe you want to start this business now and you have entrepreneurial ambitions and you're going to utilize the resources of the MBA program to further the business, which, which does happen. There's any MBA program, you're going to have a subset of classmates who are kind of ushering businesses through or come up with these business ideas while they're there. I would say in this case, if that is the case, you want to explain it really clearly and really passionately in your applications and also then tell that entrepreneurial story why that school for your entrepreneurial idea you want to have anyone with entrepreneurial goals by the way especially if they're short-term entrepreneurial goals in your application you got to be specific about what that idea anyone about the career goals needs to be specific um any career goals essay needs to be specific but i think with especially with entrepreneurial goals uh make sure they're specific and make sure you're talking about how this unique and specific resources of that program are well suited to help you take this to the next level. But taking it back to the question, um, I think, yeah, think about, is this this thing I need to do right now? Or can I keep it as a side hustle for 
three more months. I think keeping it as the side hustle would be less disruptive and disadvantageous than having to show on your resume, boom, I quit my job in December. I think when somebody looks at that on a resume, they might even think like, was that person let go? Like, I think you should be explaining that you weren't. But um, I think even if you were to apply, then um, then Lee, then do this, you know, then it's like, you know, do I have to, do, am I updating the school about it? It's weird when you interview because your interview, you're like, well, I just left my job. Why? Like, so I think you got to think about it. It's, it's a personal call on that. Is it something I got to do now? My life has led me to this moment. This is the business that I've always wanted to start. And I'm going to use the MBA as a propellant for that. Then maybe you'd think more about it. Even then you could say, if I wait three more months, at least I'm kind of clean on the app. Think about your recommenders too. Are you going to burn, you know, burn any bridges, make people angry, undermine the quality of any recommendations you're getting from your current job? I think that for the most part, it's going to look, uh, if, it, you know, if it's more of a side hustle, something that could wait two or three months, um, it's probably a little less, dis- it is less disruptive to wait to do it. So hopefully that's helpful. I know, again, it's hard to do without kind of back and forth context. Um, I'm going to, we did end up getting a nice amount of questions here. So I appreciate that. I'm going to try to pick ones that are um, a little more, you know, that can be extrapolated more broadly to people. What about someone who is a doctor and has five years of experience in a hospital? Um, so I guess this is maybe not super extra, <laughs> super applicable across um, across a lot of people. Doctors, definitely. There are definitely doctors who apply. We, we, we have worked with doctors who have applied to um, MBA, leading MBA programs. I think in those cases, you want to think about what the first thing I'd be curious to know is, what are your goals? Do you want to stay in healthcare? Um, are you looking at MBA programs or MBA MPH? programs in some cases. My own alma mater, Berkeley Haas, has a fantastic MBA, MPH program, which is two and a half years and many other schools, uh, many other leading programs do as well. So take a look at what the, you know, are you interested in just, it's just an MBA? What is the duration of the MBA? You already probably spent a lot of time studying to become a doctor. Do you also, do you want to, is it a two-year MBA, a one-year MBA? Do I want to, you know, add in the MPH with that. Many programs have dual degrees. You can look at that. So I'd be curious to know the goals and the types of programs someone is interested in. Uh, Make sure, again, the goals are super specific. That's something, a narrative construct to keep in mind throughout this entire thing, whether you're a doctor or a consultant or a you know, somebody who is from a quote unquote non-traditional pre-MBA background or a super traditional pre-MBA background. Think about what are my goals? Some schools will have essays. This is kind of the classic essay. What are your goals? Why MBA? Why our school? Think up to yourself. What are my goals looking ahead? Really specifically, short and long term is usually how questions are worded. I would even say think about short, medium, and long term. Um, what, uh, what exact job or jobs on what teams in what locations for what companies am I interested in? post MBA. That's what should be in your, in any essays that ask about goals, that's the level of specificity you want. Not just, I want to go into consulting. I want to go into healthcare. I want to go into finance. Uh, we want to know what role on what teams, where, what com- what examples of companies for companies you want to understand. This is where school research comes into play. You don't want to just name haphazard companies. You want to understand for the school that you are applying to, which companies in that industry recruit there. And for what roles? How do you do that? Well, you could look at employment reports. Every school publishes a multi-page employment report documenting this information. But if you're really going to do it and do it well, you need to engage with that school, meaning coffee chats. uh, And really, ideally, if you're interested in healthcare, we'll use that as an example. Talk to people in the healthcare club at that school. Um, I would say if you're from a certain country, too, you might want to talk to people from that country in the healthcare club 
I hate to limit who you talk to. Like I mean, you should talk to other people from multiple other countries when, when dealing with that school overall, but as it relates specifically to your goals, you want to have a granular understanding, not just about what companies in your industry recruit at that school and what roles they recruit for, but also which of those companies recruit international students and sponsor for visas. Um, you'll usually find that in a certain industry, you know, a handful of companies will recruit. Some will hire international uh, students, international graduates. Some will hire, some, some won't, some will be less inclined to. Uh, so you want to gain that granularity of understanding. Uh, so this back to this narrative construct, think about what are my goals really, really specifically, short, medium, and long term? Why are those goals my goals? Uh, what is the passion or purpose behind them? What am I seeking to solve? What business challenge? What, what business issue or world issue or social issue or problem? Um, so what are the goals really specifically short, medium, long term? Why are these goals my goals? That's kind of forward looking. Now think backwards from there. If those are my goals, what knowledge, skills, and experience do I already have that are relevant? I've already got A, B, C, D that give me an understanding or a platform or foundation to achieve those goals. I've got A, B, C, D, but I'm missing E, F, G, H. What you're missing is your essentially your YMBA. Those are my goals. I've already got A, B, C, D. I'm missing E, F, G, H, and I need an MBA to fill those gaps. Uh, I use these letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, to sort of remind applicants or even hopefully compel them to be super crystallized and specific about those, about those things that they do have and the things that they don't. And to put together a kind of a multi-layered, really thoughtful, really specific argument. I've, those are my goals. I've already got A, B, C, D, knowledge, skills, experience that are relevant. I'm missing E, F, G, H. Well, what are those? And by the way, those shouldn't just be, um, those shouldn't just be like knowledge things. Like I need to learn strategy and I need to learn operation. You got to think, think about all the different dimensions and ways that you grow in an MBA program. There's, there might be things that are knowledge related, but there are going to be things that are hands-on experience related and leadership development, personal or leadership development related, managing teams, the networks you develop, the relationships you build, the um, recruiting both through the career center and kind of on your own, given the location perhaps of your school or its network. There are all these different dimensions. Your YMBA, you don't want it to be one dimensional. You want your YMBA to think through these different areas of development, growth, and needs that you have. And that YMBA, that EFGH, it's the missing link. It's the bridge between those goals you have and the AB, those goals that you are trying to achieve in the future and the ABCD that you already have. Um, back to the, our doctor applicant here. Um, now, if she's thinking about... Uh, okay. Well, I was a doctor, you know, I'm a clinician. I, I, what kind of experience do I have like on a resume, for example, that I can highlight? I think you do. So almost kind of that ABCD, how do I make that feel relevant? Um, I think, think about, I mean, look, you, it, there's no way to like, you're, you're still a doctor. You're not going to like try to mold some, a, a doctor resume into like something it's not. You're, you're, it should be clear that, you know, what you do, you serve patients, who are those patients? But, but think about some of the other skills that go into that. I would imagine as a doctor, you're a set, even if maybe you're formally managing teams, even if you're not formally managing teams, I would imagine there's tons of informal team management, uh, nurses, other specialists, like you're, you know, you're probably we would use the term in the U.S. quarterbacking or managing, uh, you know, managing those those teams, even on an informal basis. Think about that kind of leadership and management. Think about how you have to diagnose problems. Um, think about how you have to relate to different um, relate or build relationships with very different types of patients. Think about uh 
think about, I don't know if you do, you know, if you if you also do research in your field, but if you do research in your field and that ha has really interesting analytical elements to it, um, that could be worth highlighting. If you then present any of that research or any kind of like senior facing engagement. So just think about the MBA relevant skills. If you've done anything innovative, if you, if you've changed or revamped processes, uh, if you've done anything that's more technically innovative, so it's really, it's like analytical innovation, communication, leadership, management, mentorship, um, collaboration, all these MBA relevant things you could kind of unpack. That's what I mean when I say unpack the value of what you've done. This is true of our doctor applicant and anyone else out there. Think through, un peel these layers back and you're going to find value in there. Um, so I think if you are a doctor, yes, it's, it's not anything kind of business related beforehand. But um, if you can show those MBA relevant skills in that kind of ABC, you probably show up in a resume, recommendations perhaps, and have a really, really strong and specific and, you know, purposeful, passionate kind of reason why you want an MBA and clear goals and a, an interesting kind of articulation of how, who you are and what you've done to this point as a doctor, plus the MBA and that school equal or lead to these goals, then I think, you know, you're, you've got, uh, as strong of a chance as, as any applicant. Uh, and that, that does take it full circle back to a question earlier about the nature of my work experience before an MBA. Uh, it, that applies like, if you could put that narrative together in your head, no matter what your experience is before an MBA, that's where schools are going to start paying attention. Uh, one element of that kind of narrative construct that I didn't include there, but if you have face an essay question that says, well, why our school? What are your goals? Why MBA? Why our school? Well, then you need to be equally specific about why our school. You, your why MBA might be that EFGH. Um, but then think to yourself, how does the school that I'm applying to uniquely give me E and uniquely give me F and uniquely give me G and uniquely give me H? Um, you need to attend events, virtual classes, webinars, info sessions, coffee chats. You need to speak with current students and or alumni. If you don't know any, that's fine. LinkedIn, you can use LinkedIn you, to try to find semi-warm connections. There, almost every school has student ambassadors of, front, of some variety, uh, region representatives, reach out to clubs that are of interest to you, either professionally or personally, a certain affinity group. Uh, you, for the schools that you apply to, you want to have a pattern of interest and depth, depth, real depth of understanding of that school. It's, it's, it's something we see, and I've even almost kind of accidentally hit on some of the uh, most overlooked elements, I would say, of this process. Career goal specificity and school specificity are absolutely two of them. We see people, you know, probably... I don't know, two, three months from now, we'll be getting a flood of free consultations from people who applied in round two, have good stats and didn't get any interviews or got like one or two interviews. And they say, I don't know what went wrong. And they'll share their essays with us. And the career goal specificity is drastically lacking and or these why our school specificity is drastically lacking. You need to really introspect, reflect, develop and put, uh, you know, substance to all of that. We'll continue with some more questions. Um, we do have a question about, uh, you know, someone commenting that, you know, it is, it, it does seem brutal for Indian applicants, the middle 80% range being 730 to 780 at a top 15 school. Look, by the way, you're going to find anecdotes out there. Um, somebody get a, a middle 80% range by definition. There are 10% of people who had scores below that 10% above. Um, so you will run into, I guess, 10% of the time, somebody who gets into schools like this with below a 730. So uh, it doesn't mean the statistic is wrong. It 
by definition, 10% will be uh, below that. But it is, it is, it is pretty tough sledding. Um, I think schools are, I think in those cases of super crowded and competitive applicant pools, the GMAT, it, it yeah, it, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough, uh, it, it is tough sledding. I, I mean, you have so many people with fantastic scores, but I guess schools have to slice, you know, they have to, to filter applicants. Somehow they have such a, you know, such a the supply and demand dynamics of that. So many people applying for so few spots. It does become difficult from a score perspective. But the question is, do you have similar ranges and numbers for GREs um, for Indian applicants? Now, I, I don't off the top of my head, but I think there's an interesting observation to be made. This is well documented and you can read about it. Uh, I think certain GMAT club videos and posts and other data that you'll find on the internet. Uh, there's a weird pheno phenomenon out there where if you take, if you look, pull up any school, av their average GMAT score, uh, or their any school's class profile page, and you look at their average GMAT score and their average GRE scores, quant and verbal, and then you take those quant and verbal GRE scores and you go to the ETS, Educational Testing Services, um, GRE to GMAT converter, and you plug in the G average GREs, you're usually going to get a converted GMAT that is lower than the school's actual GMAT. For example, you might have a school that has a, um, a 730 average GMAT score for their whole class. You go to that same school's class profile page, you look at their GRE, quant, and verbal. They'll usually publish each of them separately. Take those GRE, quant, and verbal, go to the ETS converter, um, plug in those GRE scores. That school, if you plug in those, those GRE averages, the converted GMAT might be a 690. I'm making up 690. It varies school to school, but it's almost always lower. I think I'm only, I think I've only come across one or two schools where it's not lower, where if you take the GRE score and convert it to a GMAT, you almost always get a lower converted score than the actual average GMAT at that school. Uh, I believe schools have contacted the ETS, one or two schools have contacted the ETS to say, uh, hey, is, are we sure this conversion is right? And they've said, yes, you know, yes, it is. Um, I think the consensus on that is that because the GMAT is such a visible, published statistic, and with still at many schools, you know, 70, 80 percent of people applying with a GMAT, it's more of a ratings, inf a rankings influencer and that kind of thing. Schools are more black and white, I guess you could say, again, especially for overrepresented applicant pools, a little more black and white about GMAT scores and a little more accepting of a range of GRE scores, meaning like, hey, we really like this applicant. And we see it sometimes too. We encounter applicants all the time who have taken the GMAT and taken the GRE. Their GMAT is like 40 points below the school's average, but their GRE is like right on top of the school's average. Well, that applicant should just apply with the GRE score. Um, that GMAT is prohibitive. Once they see it, they can't unsee it. Uh, you are, the school's average is 730. You've got a 690 GMAT. And you're from an over, it does, uh, in general, if your school's average is 730 and you have a 690 GMAT, it kind of depends on, that's applicant specific. But if you're from an overrepresented pool, a clearly overrepresented applicant pool, 730 average GMAT, you've got a 690, that's, that's, that's going to be tough. But, whoa, wait a second, my GRE score is right on top of the average or maybe above the average for that school. Think about using that GRE. So I guess it's not exact, to go back to the question, it's not exact figures and ranges. But if you do some sleuthing, po um, there are a GMAT club, uh, other resources out there have published a lot of, will summarize a lot of schools, GRE data. Um, feel free to pull that up, you know, build your own spreadsheet, pull that up, uh, go to the converter. You'll be, you'll see this kind of, the GRE trades at a discount to the GMAT. That's, I guess, the most kind of numbers oriented 
thing I could give you on GMAT versus GRE. If we're taking it back to Indian applicants, which is what this question was about, I think the nice rule of thumb, if we kind of extrapolate that rule of thumb on the GMAT side, where I want to be a good, but we could look at, so the school example that we used, it has an average GMAT score of 715 to 720. And it's, it's middle 80% for Indian applicants is 730 to 780. So the 10th percentile is above the whole, the 10th percentile for Indian students there is above the average for the whole class. Extrapolate that logic over to the GRE is, is what I would say there. So if that school had like a 326 total average GRE for the whole class, you know, maybe a 10th percentile score is like a 320 for for the Indian subset for taking the GRE is going to be a bit little tick above that. And you'd want to be then even more above that. By the way, I think in that case, the school's average GRE would probably be a little bit lower. Let's say it's like 322, 324. So maybe you, um, you know, maybe the, the 10th percentile on the GRE side for Indian applicants is if it's 324, maybe it's 325 or 326. And then you could kind of work your way up from there. So that would be, I think, the way to think about it is um, I want to be the 10th percentile for Indian applicants. If we follow the logic of this school example, whether GMAT or GRE is probably going to be above the average for the whole school. Um, so you could kind of try to do it. Maybe uh, in the off season, I'll try to put a little more specific math behind that. All right, let's, uh, we're gonna do a few more minutes here. Um, let me think, you know, some of these questions are, yeah, we do have a question here about, um, you know, how does Haas evaluate profiles for admission? I think it that's a very school specific kind of thing, but, um, I think important takeaways that we could apply or take that question and make it not just about Haas, but about other schools. Uh, it will maybe use Haas as a little bit of an example, but I think things that are, things that are applicable across schools, across all schools, essentially, are that they are, I used the word holistic before, and I know there's nuances within that, particularly as it relates perhaps to GMAT scores, for cert, especially for certain um, overrepresented applicants. But, uh, but um, schools are evaluating people based on a variety, a whole host of factors. It's not one, any one thing, and it's really, you know, who you who you are, how you come across, the quality of your resume, the quality of your experiences, where you've worked, where you've went to, where you went to school, what you studied, what you what your transcript looks like, what your GPA was, um, what roles you've had, the impact you've had at work, the progression, the career progression that you've had, um, your the quality of your recommendations. That's super important, by the way. Recommenders. So maybe I'll do a few minutes on that after this. Uh, what your goals are, how clear and specific those goals are, how clear and specific your understanding of why that school and how you can contribute to it is. Um, the quality of your essays, quality of your resume, quality of your recommendations, quality of your interview. There's this whole, you know, you, everything <laughs> is what is, they evaluate all of that. Um, now, the question was about how does Haas evaluate? And what I'm going to say there is, I'll use that as a chance to reinforce this importance of deeply immersing yourself in what a given school stands for, what their values are, what their student body is like, whether you feel that that fit, that sometimes unspoken fit with that school. Haas has something called the four defining principles, uh, which is what they've kind of built probably, I guess it's been maybe 10, even a little over 10 years now. Uh, where they've had the, the four defining principles as central to their mission, but every school's got that. Look up why why our school, any school, like look up Tuck mission and values. Um, booth, why booth? Like you could look it up for any school. There are 
There are values around which the school is built. Some are more set in stone than others. Like Haas's are pretty codified and clear. Other schools, they're not as like Booth has the Chicago approach, which kind of has certain underlying values within it, pretty codified and clear as well. Uh, other schools, it's not like as codified, but if you do your homework and immerse yourself in that school and attend panels and information sessions and really above all talk to current students and or alumni, you will start to get a sense and you'll really start to feel the pattern of what those values are for a given school. And then you want to figure out how can I infuse those into my applications and how can I, um, how can I infuse those into my applications and my interviews and make sure that I am appealing to those, not in a forced way, um, but making sure that I am showing fit, showing an understanding of and fit with those and the ability to contribute in the spirit of those values. And by the way, Haas's values are not limited only to those four defining principles, but they kind of sit, I guess, at the center of them. So that's, that's I would say schools all kind of, all schools evaluate you across the dimensions that I described, those many dimensions, academic background, professional progression of background, recommendations, essays, um, story, personal and professional story, contributions you can make. Uh, but that fit component is going to, they're all looking at that, but it, like what the nature of that fit is or what the nature of the specific nature of those values are, that's what's going to vary. Um, that's what's going to vary uh, there. Um, we have a question here about round three. I think there was an earlier question about round three as well. Round three is tough. Um, I mean, the question here is specifically from... So uh, the question is, any stats on acceptance rates in round three? If you look around online, you will find, I think they're usually unofficial, but you will find uh, acceptance rate data in round three. It usually falls off a cliff. So I would on honestly say if you're given some of the like score dynamics, th this person has a 730 GMAT, uh, is interested in M7 programs and is applying from an overrepresented, I think, applicant pool. Uh, I think you should think about applying not in round three, but in round one of next year. If you look, I don't know if you just joined the conversation, but we were just talking about how schools in the U.S. 10 to 15 range of the rankings, a 730 would be a 10th percentile score uh, among Indian applicants. M7, it's going to be even higher than that. So I think you, and, and in round three, um, it's going to be even harder than that if we pull up the blog post that I mentioned earlier that tonight's moderator put together about four years ago, Indian applicants with a seven, when we look at the U.S. top 20, the whole U.S. top 20, Indian applicants with a 720 or 730 GMAT have a 5% acceptance rate. That's Indian applicants, 720 or 730 GMAT across the whole U.S. top 20. 5% acceptance rate, huge sample size, uh, 5,000 applicants, 5% acceptance rate in round three, I, round three might typically have some fraction of round one and two's acceptance rate, I, like a fifth of it maybe. So now you're down at 1% and that 5% becomes 1%. And you're talking about M7 schools. This study is the whole top 20. So I would really encourage the applicant who posed that question, um, you know, again, hear, hear the data, visualize the data, see the data, um, every applicant, be realistic about, like, be ambitious with this, include, I'm not saying telling people don't like include reach schools, but have a, have a thoughtful and nuanced school strategy, any app, school strategy, by the way, it should include reach schools. You, if you get into every school you applied to, you didn't reach hard enough, right? You almost want to uh, make sure, you know, you want to push the envelope, reach for the stars, be ambitious. But I think we also want to marry that ambition and that optimism with uh, with some of the data. And in this case, both 
something we've been talking about for a large portion of the last hour, as well as is you know clear on the screen. I think this in this case, this person, and this is somebody you you know think about this on a case by case basis. If you're not sure, um, post on GMAT Club and solicit feedback or whatever the case may be. I think in this case, this applicant who posed that question, you probably want to look at round one. I would say if you're interested in M7 programs, I know nothing about the rest of your profile and whether that's even a possibility, but you probably want to look not at round three, but at round one of next year. And you will need to, uh, in all likelihood, boost that GMAT score a little bit more. Um, recommendations I mentioned briefly. Uh, I, I talked a little bit a moment ago about overlooked elements of the of the you know th things we see every year when people get dinged or don't get invited to interview and they don't know what went wrong and they reach out to us. Uh, lack of career goal specificity and YMBA specificity, lack of school research and engagement immersion. That's that takes time, by the way, too. If you're just starting on this, you got you're gonna have a busy uh, you know a busy four or five weeks if you're applying in round two. Be school research and engagement is. You've got like you've got resume, you've got essays, you've got recommendations, and you've got school research and engagement. I usually think of those as the four pillars of the application execution process: resume, essays, recommendations, and school research and engagement. Those last two people, I think, don't fully grapple with the importance of school research and engagement. I've harped on. Uh, we, as a starting point, I like for people to think about, are there like three events I can attend for this school and three students I can talk to? Three students I could talk to, who could they be? Maybe one should be, one should definitely be specific to your goals. And again, I said earlier, ideally even somebody from your home country who has recruited into exactly the space you've recruited into, because you don't just want to just know what companies hire at that school and for what teams and locations. You also want to know which companies hire international students. This is good, by the way, for school selection. Should I even apply there? Am I interested in going there? But it's imperative then for your um, for your apps. Think about, is there another social group or cultural group or affinity group, other personal interests I might have? You could put together a list of, you know, three, perhaps three students per school to speak with. So that takes time. That takes time. That takes outreach. Uh, I know we're working in kind of, if for people applying in round two, not many weeks to go here. Again, if you are interested in, you say, wait a second, I need some, you know, sort of uh, guidance in this process. Feel avantiprep.com. It's up there on the website. Feel free to sign up. I mentioned earlier, I'll say it again at the end, we are running a 10% discount on hourly services through a week from tomorrow through December 10th. Uh, we already have some of the most attractive, I would say, senior consultant hourly services rates that are out there. Um, so the savings, you know, we, we, we understand that it's not a small investment, but the savings are significant relative to other situations you might encounter in the marketplace. Uh, and I think that the reviews are among the best you'll find. But um Essays, resume, recommendations, school research and engagement. Taking it back now to recommendations. Overlooked, I think, in terms of their importance. In a typical process, you're, you want to think about, all right, recommender selection. Who could? Most schools, you still need two recommendations, some moving more toward one. But I need two recommenders. Uh, most programs want one to be your current supervisor. You got to think about whether you could do that. Um, depth. Of not, it should be somebody who did manage you or supervise you. They should be super, super um, senior to you, and like not a peer, senior to you and managed you, supervised you, with substance, with depth. Like it, title is is less important than how deep and insightful they can be. Uh, but you know, sometimes you might have two people who are know you equally well. And, as long as they can do an equally good job, maybe a slightly more senior person, you could ask that. But you got to figure out it's totally case by case. Um, so is it a current supervisor or maybe a previous supervisor? Two recommenders. If somebody's really involved outside of work, you're like a president of a nonprofit or an NGO or a youth board or something.
sometimes you could get and you have a supervisor there. That could be interesting too, but probably only when, you know, there's real substance there, really, really deep involvement. Uh, so recommender selection. Then what you typically want to do, or we would suggest, is <clears throat> put together, set up a couple of meetings. It's probably, I think, a couple of meetings, ideally, with your recommenders. Maybe the first meeting, after you've already asked them, are they willing to do this? Maybe the first meeting is a little more logistical. These are the schools I'm applying to. These are the deadlines. And I would suggest compiling or consolidating the questions, the recommendation questions that they need to answer. They're usually going to be similar, if not identical, between schools. Watch out, though, because some schools do have an extra question. Kellogg has an extra question for recommenders. Haas has an extra question. NYU Stern has an extra question. Uh, there are schools out there that kind of use the common questions, but then add one of their own. Um, but look across the schools so you can figure out, all right, these are the three main or two or three main questions. And then, by the way, Haas asks this extra question. Kellogg asks this one. Try to synthesize it down. I think if even if you're applying to like six schools, is there a way to make it feel for your recommenders that they just have to kind of answer this main list and then um, they'll have what they need for all the different schools? So first meeting with them, more logistical. Maybe there's a second meeting, and here's where the thought and work comes into play. And schools encourage this, explicitly encourage this. Just like you might before the a year-end review at work, a performance review, your year-end evaluation, or whatever that process is happening, a lot of people put together like a two-page highlight reel or a two-page summary of their major accomplishments for the year at work. Same idea here. You're sitting down with your recommender. That recommender managed you for like three years, let's say, or two or three years. You're, at, you're asking them to answer this slate of questions. Well, what kind of two page, what do you hope that they could cover? They're the one who is going to write the recommendation and they should write the recommendation. But you and schools absolutely invite and endorse this. Uh, Give them, you know, give them a menu of examples, like the things that you know them better. You're the one who did them. Like, think about what are the strengths and themes and supporting examples that I hope my recommender could cover. Doesn't mean they're going to cover it, each of those things you put on the page, but what could you call to their attention uh, on kind of a, we call it recommendation strategy, recommender prep, I guess you could call it. Think about those things. So my point is you recommendations, you don't just tap your recommender on the shoulder and then that's it. Just as essays and recommendations and school research and engagement should be in your mind as like pillars of what you need to kind of own and think about, recommendations should fit in that as well. You don't ultimately own the doing of the recommendation. That should be them. Um, but essays resume, recommendations, school research and engagement, there are steps to take and a process for you to manage. Again, it might be multiple meetings with each recommender. Again, I know we're running out of weeks here before those round two deadlines, but um, school recommender selection and then recommender prep with each recommender. What does that entail? Probably a couple of meetings, one more logistical. These are the deadlines. These are the schools. These are the questions. And then another more of substance put together a two pager and you got to know who you know, your rec know thyself and know thy recommender is your recommender. Somebody who wants like more detail in that summary or less detail in that summary, just bullet points, or are you putting a little more substance on the page? But think about it. Even have that discussion. I, I back when I applied, I think some of my recommenders almost used it as like a real deep, like performance evaluate, like an extended performance evaluation. Greg, here are the things that, you know, I think you really thrive at and here are the things that I think you um, could work on during your MBA. And those are the types of questions that they encounter in the recommendations. So think about that and you, you know, you want to have them, you know, the recommendations, specificity there as well is super important. We don't want recommenders to just make these like glowing superficial claims the applicant is really smart and i call them 
I call them sometimes the Dear John recommendations of the past. Like, Dear Admissions Committee, uh, the applicant is really smart and hardworking and would be a valuable asset to your school. We got to go way deeper than that. Think about distinct school. Each recommender will almost certainly have to answer a question. How does the performance of the applicant compare to others you've managed in similar roles, i.e. what are their principal strengths? Think about with your recommender or encourage your recommender to think about um, the explicit, how do have you performed relative to others they've managed? Who have they managed? Like if they managed like 200 people from top schools in your country over the course of the last 20 years, and they think that you're in the top 3% of those people, they should say that in there. Um, have you, have, have you performed so well that you've been promoted two times and were assigned to this like leadership committee and asked to lead some huge project? They should say that. So there's that performance piece of the question, i.e. what are their principal strengths? That's plural. Think about, encourage your recommender to think about multiple strengths that they can highlight. We don't want to walk away from this with like some one dimensional thing that you're like good at Excel or like analysis. We want to go deeper. We want to go more diverse and deeper than that. What are the stand? Everyone is good at the basics. You got to, you're trying to stand out here with recommendations. Um, it wouldn't just be that you're like have good analytical skills, but is it the way you use them to come up with new approaches to things or to see things that others don't? Is it ways that you use those analytical skills to creatively problem solve or to innovate on something? That might be one strength. Now, that strength should have a specific example from your recommender in the recommendation supporting or illustrating the claim. They can't just make the claim. They have to illustrate it with a specific example. We don't just want to know what you did. We, we did. We want to know how you did it. And we want to know what the impact was quantified if possible. So think about like strength A and supporting example, how you did it, you know, these are details of that example. Now they should think about the same for like, Strength B or strength C it doesn't mean they have to have three strengths in there, but that's what I mean by not one dimensional. Don't stop, go deeper with each. Um, not just the basics is like smart person, team player, go deeper than that. They should go deeper than that. Uh, each claim or strength should be illustrated by a concrete example. And as we look across the strengths for each recommender, we want to hear about different parts of you. I just mentioned like kind of creative problem solving or innovation. Well, what about leadership, management skills, team, being a team player, reinventing things? Um, oh gosh, there's like, I mean, international collaboration, cross-cultural collab, like you, there's the whole host of themes you can um, think about and discuss. And they should be true to you and true to that supervisor or manager's knowledge of you. Uh, but try to sit down with them, prep them. I know, again, it's a little bit time consuming. It's hard to do these things in just a matter of weeks, but uh, recommendations are a big, and we do brainstorm those. That, when we talk about, if you go to our service page, people say, well, what is recommendation strategy? It's basically exactly what I just mentioned. Um, it's with you, the applicant, not directly with the recommender, but in preparation for your sit down with your recommender, let's talk. We can talk about those strengths, those themes, those examples. And you got to figure out now, how do I want to, how do you want to consolidate that? Is it, do I have the type of recommender who probably just wants this on like one page? You're not writing it for them. You're giving them a primer of ideas or examples that you hope or themes or strengths that you hope that they can, uh, that they can, capture. So that's a little dive into uh, a little dive into um, into recommendations. Somebody asked for a link to a blog post. I, I think they're asking about the MBA admissions chances one. It was posted. Let's see if our moderator is still around and can share it. Um, let me see. If our moderator's still around, they will put the link in there. I will also share a window if this is the 
blog post or the study that's being asked about should come up in a second. Maybe not. Hmm. With a, my apologies, I don't think that that's coming up. Basically, if you're asking about the the blog post that includes the study of Indian acceptance acceptance rates of Indian applicants by GMAT score, you could basically just Google it's it, GMAT Club acceptance rates of Indian applicants by GMAT score, and it will be the first thing that comes up or MBA admission chances for Indian applicants top 50 analysis. Apo apologize that I can't seem to get that up there. And I actually don't, to my knowledge, control. Oh, you know what? I'll just, I think I can put it in the chat. Oh no. Yeah. So <laughs> we get into the details of this system. I'm not the one who's able to post uh, text at the bottom of the screen, nor am I able to comment in the group chat. So uh, I think if you scroll, no, so, okay. But Google what I mentioned, MBA admission chances for Indian applicants, top 50 analysis. You'll be able to find the, uh, the link that I mentioned. So I think we can leave it there for today. As a reminder, if anyone is uh, seeking guidance on their Round two applications, please visit avantiprep.com. We are running uh, a promo. It's basically our Black Friday promo from last week. It was supposed to expire tomorrow. I just extended it for a week, I guess. Uh, you're the ones who are hearing about it. Uh, it's to save an extra 10% on hourly services through December 10th, senior consultant hourly services through December 10th with code 21R. Two one zero. That's code two one R two one zero. You could also sign up for a free consultation if you'd like to chat before signing up. Avantiprep.com. You've got the link there. Again, I'll note. I, I realize that you know hourly services pricing or any services in this space, they're not a small investment. Totally aware of that. But if you do do your homework across other kind of leading firms, other GMAT club affiliated firms, you will find that our senior consultant hourly services are relative to average pricing across the marketplace are 50 to $115 cheaper per hour. So that adds up to pretty significant savings. You know, you start signing up for 10 hours, 20 hours of service, you're looking at 500 to two, over 2000, 500 to 2300 dollars in savings by that math, uh, which is, is significant. And we're knocking another 10% off with uh, this discount code 21R210, 21R210. Save an extra 10% through December 10th. So avantiprep.com, we appreciate your time today. I kind of like this uh, open Q&A. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it was helpful to you. I got one more question here that will hang up. What is the etymology of the name Avanti? So I have gotten this question before. I've Avanti in Italian means uh, forward, essentially. Andiamo avanti. We go forward. Uh, I have uh, Italian background in my family, on both sides of my family. So it's a little bit of an homage to that, as well as, as, well as this idea with what we're doing together here um, in working with applicants is to try to bring them forward and try to go forward together. Um, the idea as well that you in your, with your MBA are hopefully thinking forward about your goals. Um, and that uh, the work we do together can help propel you toward them. I think especially in cases where we work, if we work together with, with some depth, um, I think any amount of time that we work together is beneficial. Absolutely. People sign up for five hours of service. We're happy to 
help you any way we can. Three hours of service, five hours of service, whatever the case may be. Especially in situations though, where where there's more depth, 10, 20 hours packages. Uh, if you le- read through a lot of the reviews, I think applicants walk away from the experience feeling that they not just re- that they did not just receive guidance on their application process, but that they had a coach, friend, mentor through the process, and that they're interviewing. You know, not not only are their essays and resumes and recommendations and applications stronger, but their whole idea of how they communicate themselves, how they message things, how they highlight their strengths, how they interview. Um, I've seen tremendous evolution, again, probably more so in packages, admittedly, but like tremendous evolution and improvement in applicants, communication skills, writing skills, outreach skills, networking skills, interview skills over the course of uh, over the course of this process, if we take pride in that, it's not just, you know, hey, let's review your resume. You know, we, we hope that where the opportunity is it presents itself, we could we could have an even deeper impact than that. So, but I am aware that, uh, and I learned this at you, it's like you should do your homework. Um, <laughs> I am aware that Avanti is also a name in India, I believe a female name. Um, so uh, <laughs> I don't know that, I guess we work with many applicants from India. So I guess that worked out. Uh, and I get that question a lot. I should probably put it up on the website or something. So thank you, um, Akshay, for asking. Hope today's call was helpful. Akshay has bid me arrivederci. Uh, so I wish everyone else um, arrivederci and good luck. And uh, please feel free to reach out by Avanti Prep at avantiprep.com. You can sign up for services, 10% discount um, using the discount code 21R210 through December 10th, or sign up for a free consultation. We wish you the best of luck and hope to see you next time. Thank you.